Wow. Hello. Welcome to MOCA. I'm Amanda Hunt, Director of Education and Public Programs, and I'm going to keep my remarks ever so brief. Just thank you all for being here. We're thrilled to welcome Connie Tell, Director of the Feminist Art Project, oh my goodness, sorry, uh, at the Center for Women in Arts and Humanities at Rutgers University. Uh, I'm going to hand things over to my colleague, Lanka Tattersall, curator here at MOCA Los Angeles, Jamila James curator of ICA LA, our headliner, Martha Rosler. I can barely contain my excitement. Thank you all for being here. Connie, take it over. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I was introduced already, so I don't have to tell you that. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2018 TFAP at CAA Day of Panels, Feminism and the State, Art, Politics, and Resistance. We are delighted to be back in the Amundsen Auditorium, and I thank MOCA for generously hosting us again. When we held our day of panels here in 2012, we were midway through a period of decency and optimism. Barack Obama was, <laughs> Barack Obama was serving as our 44th president and would soon be reelected for a second term. Now we are faced with challenges that demand forceful, persistent action and our renewed commitment to the feminist principles of recognition, equality, and empowerment. I'm grateful to the panelists and moderator uh, for speaking, for being here today and uh, to share their perspectives and strategies for resistance. There are many people to thank for their time and expertise in putting together this event and making sure it runs smoothly. Uh, so in the interest of saving time, that's most, of it, that's most everyone. Uh, but please allow me to acknowledge the many volunteers and MOCA staff who are working hard to make sure today goes off without a hitch. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, please join me in welcoming to the podium this year's symposium chairs, Jimila James and Lanka Tattersall. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right. Uh, first, I would like to thank Mocha and their very talented staff and thank them for hosting today's event. Connie Tell on the Feminist Art Project and the College Art Association, and of course my co-chair, Anka Tattersall. And also want to extend best wishes to Jennifer Gonzalez who won't be able to join us today. Um, since receiving the invitation for the Feminist Art Project to organize this event, much has transpired in the public's conception of feminist ideals and activism. Today's symposium entitled Feminism in the State, Art, Politics, and Resistance is the second organized since the election of the current administration that will not be named. And in a year's time, women, immigrants, and people of color, the working class, and the LGBTQ community, among countless others, have faced one challenge after another to a pursuit of everyday life and liberty. In response, dissent and action has taken many forms. Hashtag activism, coalescing into direct action in the streets, open letters naming names and demanding change, giving way to a slow dismantling of abused power relations within the workplace and elsewhere, and rallies, strikes, boycotts, and walkouts are being organized and carried out with a ferocity rarely seen in the US since the die-ins of ACT UP in the 1980s, the gay and women's liberation movements of the 1960s and 70s, and the ongoing black civil rights movement. It is in these conditions that we consider how feminism can be understood and enacted beyond our embodied experiences, the different ways in which a feminism can inform work in the real world and in artistic production, and how collectively we can address its historical shortcomings, that is, the challenge of collaboration and troubled orientation with intersectionality. The program today is organized in four sections with rather broad themes to allow for a very open dialogue. The three sessions, bo Borders, Bodies, and Access to Knowledge as Power, which show Halajian, Galari Kojgazarian, Casey Park, and Latia Perta, is about the exchange and resource sharing across perceived and actual boundaries. The Web as Political Space, with Aria Dean, Cece Moss, Lupe Rosales, Martine Sims, and Angela Washko, considering models of representation and the political implications of working online. And a roundtable, curatorial and artistic strategies around activism, representation, and collective space, with Sarah Williams, Courtney Fink, Kate Johnston, Young June Kwok, and Colleen Smith, on the variety of creative approaches taken to organizing, collaboration, and making space. But first. Lanka Tattersall, my beloved co-chair of today's event, will introduce our keynote speaker, Martha Rossler. I too am fangirling out beyond the moon. 
uh, his very necessary and ever timely artistic and scholarly contributions to the field were central to the organization of this event. Thank you and enjoy. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, just a tiny bit of information about ever important lunch. Uh, we will be taking a lunch break. A little, probably it will start a little bit late, but um, lunch options, there's actually Lemonade, which is a cafe just out on the courtyard of Mocha. That's one of the lunch options for you, just so you guys know about that. Pivot. Um, <laughs> it is an enormous pleasure and privilege to introduce today's keynote speaker, Martha Rosler. When Jamila and I first began our conversations about the potential of this symposium and who would make the most sense to invite as a keynote speaker, we both immediately decided on the absolute necessity of inviting Martha Rosler. In this time in which so many of us feel the urgency of, of critique and concrete action, Rosler's decades of astute and grounded analysis of the conditions of social life and possibilities for change are ever more relevant. Both Jamila and I have been learning from Rosler for many years, as, I sure many, as I'm sure many in this room have. I vividly remember the first time I saw Rosler's landmark 1975 video, Semiotics of the Kitchen. It was the summer between my junior and senior years in college, and as I watched Rosler wield an alphabetically organized assortment of kitchen items with both deadpan humor and slight menace, I was learning how to analytically take apart language and the stuff of everyday life in order to craft a new set of critical tools and to shift the ways we describe the limits and possibilities of the social world. Through her work, sorry about that, Rosler transforms the ways we experience and interpret the public sphere, contemporary media, and feminism. Since the late 1960s, Rosler's practice has, encompa has encompassed photography, performance, video, installation, and critical and theoretical writings. These range to her from her series of collages of the late 1960s and early 70s, House Beautiful, Bringing the War Home, which made literal the description of the Vietnam War as the living room war to her meta-monumental garage scale, a large-scale version of the garage sale presented in the atrium of the Museum of Modern Art in 2012, at which participants were invited to haggle over prices, an event that knit together acts of performance with the symbolic and literal dimensions of how we define the value of objects and in what contexts. In her widely influential critical and theoretical writings as well, Rosler has provided us time and again with roadmaps for ways to expose, analyze, and transform ideas of truth, power, and privilege, and in turn to begin to imagine how things could be different. And so without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Martha Rosler. I'm honored and daunted to be, have been invited to lead off this symposium framed in relation to urgent questions of resistance art, <clears throat> politics, and intriguingly, the state. Hmm. I hope by the end of today we learn more what we mean by all those terms. I see I'm going to have problems. <clears throat> I continue to be interested in the way that art and activism overlap in terms of people and places. It's interesting to think about when art is looking inward and when it's looking outward to spaces and practices valued for their distance from art as we know it. I want to speak about context, to talk about how we frame and reframe issues for purposes of both analysis and activism, thinking toward the formation of alliances about how art and activism may come together before jumping into a version of the standard artist talk centering on lessons learned along the way. In 1914, the English-born, Canadian-raised suffragette Mary Richardson slashed Velasquez's Roque B. Venus in London's National Gallery. Our impression of her and of her act shifts with whatever constellation of actions and events we choose to remember. She was an arsonist for the cause, a white woman, an unsuccessful labor candidate, a wartime patriot, and someone who, in 1932, joined the British Union of Fascists that was formed by ex-Labor MP Oswald Mosley because she saw fascism, fascism as the only path to a greater Britain and that women would have a large part in establishing it. Or she may have thought that the fascist groups intended to smash class distinctions. 
She quit the fascist union after about a year over betrayed promises to women and never mentioned it again. Richardson had been moved to join the Women's Social and Political Union, founded by Emmeline Pankhurst, after witnessing as a young journalist in 1910 the extraordinary police violence, including sexual assault over six hours in a crackdown ordered by the Home Secretary Winston Churchill against the women peaceably demanding the vote at the House of Commons during the event now called the Black Friday uh, protests. <clears throat> I don't expect you to read these things. It's like a little anchor. The suffragettes were firm proponents of violent fight back and jujitsu, as they had been so often attacked by police. So many women attacked paintings. Uh, where am I? In those days, that galleries refused to allow unaccompanied women to enter. <laughs> Richardson had been one of the first victims of force feeding under the Cat and Mouse Act, which means that they let you get better, at, uh, well, they threw you out um, after you were deteriorating, and then when you got better, they hauled you back in. Um, she considered force feeding to be not only painful but immoral, as well as literally sin and, may, and literally sinful to accept without resistance. She was a sometime artist, and she sat in the gallery sketching for hours, raising the courage to do the deed. After slashing the painting, Richardson tied her thinking, thinking to the comparative valuation of women in paintings. Quote, I've tried to destroy the picture of the most beautiful woman in mythological history as a protest against the government for destroying Mrs. Pankhurst, who is the most beautiful character in modern history, unquote, and more directly tied it to financial matters. Values, she said, were stressed from a financial point of view and not the human. I felt I must make my protest from the financial point of view, therefore, as well as letting it be seen as a symbolic act money, beauty, symbolic act. I had to draw the parallel between the public's indifference to Mrs. Pankhurst, she's the founder of the Women's um, Social and Political Union, the suffragists, uh, to Mrs. Pankhurst's slow destruction and the destruction of some financially valuable object. A painting came to mind. <laughs> Decades later, she told an interviewer that she disliked the way the quote, the way men visitors gaped at it all day long. <laughs> Let me assure you, I feel little affinity with Richardson and I don't support her attack. But she came to mind when I was thinking about iconoclasm and the present day resonance of her act. How much of her confusing history would appear where would we would be likely to see it? I thought about the tabloidization of culture visible on social media, which is no news to anyone here. But the reductiveness of meme culture and old school gotcha call outs now seem to be affecting more communications than simply those from troll factories, but also those from some scholars and often in relation to the history of women's, quote, resistance to the state, unquote. <clears throat> Apart from the treachery of social media, I was surprised by the identical catchphrases that my sympathetic and intelligent young male assistants told me they had learned in gender study classes about the goals of a now reified second wave feminism. Uh, I was stunned by its flatness and identical dismissal. I somehow doubt that they learned about the long get-togethers, for example, convened by women in San Diego, where I lived for a decade, including from the nation's first gender studies department, arguing whether patriarchy or racism was the primary contradiction in so many words. I don't ask activists to teach me history at the point of struggle, 
but we do need more and better histories from historians and art historians. I hope we can agree. Iconoclasm has been carried out by a variety of religions, but also looms in secular demands that artworks deemed offensive be removed from public view or destroyed. The Rokeby Venus was a canonical work of high financial and cultural value, but today we've seen attacks on such established works far less often than attacks on contemporary art by living artists. I don't mean someone pulling a kitchen cleaver out of her sleeve and hacking away at the object, though that happens, usually by men, as much as I mean articulating demands for removal of works for, from view and in a few central cases for their destruction. In a recent case, destruction was carried out with the assent of the artist as a communal symbolic act in taking back the telling of a historical criminal injustice not this. In some cases, destruction is cast as removing the possibility of financial gain or career and reputation advancement. In the wake of the Me Too movement, we've seen just a few petitions by a small number of women for the removal from public view, though not the destruction, of works depicting women, that's not this, especially young women, mostly by male painters. The culture wars of the 80s, driven by the retardataire right, went after mostly photographers like Robert Maplethorpe, Andres Serrano, and perhaps Sally Mann. But Me Too, focused as it is on perpetrators in the workplace, albeit with blurred boundaries, has evoked the question whether works by abusive men, regardless of the nature of the work, be banned and their names expunged from the rolls of honor. It's hard to avoid seeing this as a moral panic, variety sex panic, but it is also much more than that. Nevertheless, the similarity of these demands with past and present ones motivated by religious beliefs we likely don't share, such as the demand for moral purity cannot just be wished away. I'm leaving out of consideration the timely and in fact belated demands to remove from public space statues, friezes, plaques, etc., in celebration of terrible events and hideous people in US history, pursuant to removing them from the honored place in the state's official narrative, any aesthetic issues notwithstanding. I think some of them have hung around so long that we forgot to see them until recently. I'm also ignoring the banishment of Richard Serra's art artwork, Tilted Ark, which is a whole other story. I've written about it. <laughs> we now seem to take for granted that what artworks provide are experiences and narratives, and by experiences, I'm not really talking about aesthetic ones. Powerful iconoclastic calls, as I've indicated, are made by injured parties claiming, in effect, ownership rights, to put it crudely, to the narratives of pain and suffering. Those stories might previously have been told about them, if at all. Having them still told by others is taken as a further injury. Here there seem to be only two sides to the story, the oppressed or the oppressor, the master or the slave in Hegel's terms. Demands for censure might not have been quite so comprehensive at earlier moments when formal appeals to equality under the law, such as for access to education to civil rights, might have forestalled them. At other moments, solidarity movements with universalist goals, a direction of solidarity that deeply interests me, would have extended beyond a group defined by an identity of directly shared oppression. So solidarity with others in the struggle. Genocides or slavery or suppression of women, events of great proportion, have given rise to industries of telling, but the historical scope of these events, many hardly resolved means that the situation has plenty of time for continued evolution 
here I have to catch up with. So that was um, Chris O'Feely's Holy Virgin Mary, which had a calumny against it, uh, removing the white paint that an old woman in protest threw on it. I'll leave that there. Guy Debord, famously named Advanced Industrial Society, the Society of the Spectacle, and I bet you're tired of hearing it. <laughs> Positing that <clears throat> the spectacle is not a collection of images, which is why I have to keep mentioning it. Rather, it is a social relationship between people that is mediated by images. And it is not something added to the real world, not a decorative element, so to speak. On the contrary, it is the very heart of society's real unreality. In all its specific manifestation, news or propaganda, advertising or the actual consumption of entertainment, the spectacle epitomizes the preva prevailing model of social life, end quote. It's hard to argue with this. This has surely helped drive our close attention to the nuances of public image and articulation, the rights and copyrights attaching to these images and articulations, and the power inherent in their wielding. Some consequent art world practices are appropriation and its relatives, re-performance, re-staging, re-reading others' writing and speeches, and borderline plagiarism, or plagiarism. <laughs> and so-called branding as well as fights over credit, career building, cultural capital, and financial rewards in a massively capitalized art world. Protests against less elevated works in the Rokeby Venus aren't new. In the contentious 80s, people on the left and the right protested the work of various artists, including African Americans, on race-based grounds. There were protests from the left against depictions of women and from the right for performances relating to gender and AIDS, and at the end of the 90s, for imaginary sacrilege against Christianity and the Virgin Mary. In the 1970s, feminists protested pornography in its many forms. As you'll soon see, I did as well from the perspective of power relations. I considered myself sex positive, as it came to be called, but had no personal interest in being a porn consumer, even though I had in the mid-60s sent holiday cards with drawings of people having sex. <laughs> Eventually, in thinking about all this, I recalled an attack on a work of my own from the early 1970s that gathered up a lot of cutout photos of Playboy models. Can you see? Okay, from here it's a little, okay. The, criticism were, the criticisms were raised more than three decades after the work's making when it was reproduced on the cover of a catalog for a feminist art exhibition that had its genesis right here at MOCA. Ta-da. <laughs> A group mostly of women painters, if my memory serves, denounced the work to the curatorial staff and to me. This negative response was said to be because the cover image would circulate on the internet and men could gape at it at will. Men looking. And as an art historian wrote, it is, quote, ambiguous, unquote, in its relation to women's bodies. Um, as if. <laughs> The whack cover dust up reminded me of uh, reminded me of one of Mary Richardson's latter day remarks about the Venus she slashed that she was annoyed because of the way men look at it, and it's hard not to feel sympathetic. It's difficult to tell a critique of representation from representation unframed by anything other than approbation. The question of framing was raised long ago first in my lifetime that I recall in regard to Warhol's Brillo boxes. But it's just a Brillo box. Well, but it's a Brillo box made out of wood in a gallery. And in fact, a whole bunch of them. Still, I myself have saved a number of show announcements and European art world photo magazine covers using what I'll call questionable images of women. I save them because they make me mad. <laughs> The designer of the catalog cover, 
who taught for years at the women's building and the curator, two estimable feminists, didn't accept my prediction that the image would not be well received. <laughs> I'm gonna take a minute to say that there was an issue about the word because, and this is so interesting to me, not the word, but its placement, because the breasts of the central figure were deemed a little bit too much, and so it was kind of better to just hide them. <laughs> she's there because she's one of the few women of color at all ever to be shown in Playboy in that era, just to say. In the, 90, in the 90s, a feminist grad student of mine vigorously protested my screening of Carol Lee Schneeman's film, Fuses, and a prominent woman artist friend, a feminist despite rejecting the label, asked me back then about my 1977 video, Vital Statistics, whether I wasn't upset about displaying the quote, undraped figure of a woman, in that case, my own. This is also from that video. Now I'll step back f further to the 60s, and here's where we fall into the trap of the artist talk. My life as a politically active person predated the return of feminism to the public stage, although feminist agitation was already at a low boil by the time I got to college. Heated by the publication of Simone de Beauvoir's book, The Second Sex, and later by Betty Friedan's Feminine Mystique. The social and political regimes of the Cold War 50s, which had enforced materialist conformism and political rigidity, were under pressure for so many reasons from the huge post-war generation. And as activism took off, we lost our fear of arrest and government reprisal. In high school, I'd done minor outreach for the Congress of Racial Equality, handing out postcard petitions, though signing a petition could get you blacklisted for life. I also joined a small group refusing to take cover during a mandatory citywide nuclear air raid drill, instead standing in front of City Hall facing arrest. I was reported to my school and my parents, who threatened to disown me, of course. Their plan was to have me, their plan for me was to have me train as a legal stenographer and get married by age 19. My art, my ideas were no threat to my family as long as they didn't endanger our standing in the religious community. But ironically, my interest in social affairs and social justice was surely underpinned by my religious education. This was a common New York ethos among Jews, universalists to the core. And from an early age, I thought I'd be either a criminal or an artist, but being an artist seemed less risky. <laughs> Coward. <laughs> Rather than study stenography, I went to Brooklyn College, which was tuition free. I majored in physics, but switched to English after my brother, a physicist, called to warn me that no one would eat lunch with me if I, ent if I entered the field. <laughs> the war, I'm glad to give you opportunities to laugh, because otherwise I think you're going like, what is she talking about? <laughs> Um, the war raging in Vietnam was a forbidden topic on our campus, as at many others, as it was declared outside our purview as students until the spreading student movement wiped out that prohibition. At Brooklyn, as at so many schools, we went on strike for the right to protest. Our generation enthousi enthusiastically embraced mass action in the form of demonstrations, occupations, sit-ins, teach-ins, and counter-cultural love-ins and be-ins. I'm just gonna, I do wanna say I actually was there. This is 63, you know, that's how old I am, right? We drove down to Washington for Brooklyn. In 
in response to the war, social upheavals and urban insurrections, political movements formed, including the so-called social movements taking off from the civil rights and labor movements, which were often intertwined. SDS and its offshoot, the Weather Underground, Marxist-Leninist and Maoist groups, the Black Panthers, Chicano and Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican movement, sorry, Asian American movement, the women's movement, gay and lesbian liberation movements, third world solidarity movements, and more. Blank. <laughs> Academic courses notwithstanding, I saw myself as an artist and attended classes, training as an abstract painter. Maybe we should take a minute and just breathe because I feel like, thank you, thank you. Abstract expressionism was the only game in town. Politically disengaged and quietist and it's at its highest philosophical plane, stressing transcendence and the sublime. But the understanding of the post-war, the understandings of the post-war art world were crumbling, and pop underlined modernist decrepitude. Pop radically refocused attention away from atemporal transcendence onto human-made mass culture, from the sublime to the quotidian. What would follow transcendence? A good question. For me. Pop precipitated a crisis as it emptied of power the presumption that art stemmed from some unnameable source, whether genius or inspiration. Pop thus turned style into a choice. More broadly, it stripped the alibis from formalism, exposing the gendered basis of imagery. I didn't exactly give up oil painting, but I took up photography. Yet social documentary raised troubling questions of differential power between photographer and the typical subject, and I held it in abeyance for a while. Ridiculing political hypocrisy, I made large pop-inspired collages out of photographed rituals, gestures, and interactions. Women began agitating against social expectations and against the images pushed on us by advertising. I made smaller scale works with figures from historical artworks and ads. Ads from the New York Times joined with pictures from discarded copies of Playboy and cheap porn. These are two. Many of these works had room-like spaces since women were often shown in interiors as household appliances. <laughs> this is actually from, it's not from WAC, but it's okay. So there were a lot of this. Included were these two works from the early 1970s. Um, what I need to say about this one because it's important to understand what I'm thinking about. Um, it's not simply about the internationalization of the production of the face. It's about invisible labor, uh, and it's invisible labor in, in more than one uh, manifestation in the, in the piece, in the work. Obviously, this backstage work is always visible. Uh, the, the, we're constantly being shown how to do this in order to look like whatever we're supposed to look like at the end, but it's also about the labor, which you may not even have given a minute of thought to, of the men of color on the dock who are actually doing the work to transmit this. This is about the material basis on which uh, transmissions occur. I just often have to say that because people like to ignore it. Um, and of course, this one, another kind of labor. Um, but this one is called Hot House Harem after Angla. So like many of these works, they, it also, I was attempting to invoke, there was another one that invoked uh, Magritte, um, our own relationship to images in our world, not just in advertising or pornography. 
Images of the ferocious war in Vietnam were everywhere by the mid-60s, including, shockingly, on television at dinner time. How could we be inured to these pictures of the dead and wounded of bombs and burning huts and jungles? Jolted by a memorable newspaper image, which I think was this one uh, by Sawada, Sawada, I thought of how to adapt my montages to protest the war. The anti-war flyers handed out on marches, I realized, mostly wound up in the nearest trash can. You might agree with the sentiments, but they had too many strange arguments and little blank space. I'd make montages without text to hand out instead. <clears throat> in life, the ubiquitous weekly photos of war shared space with product ads for the ideal American home. That home at mid-century be speaking order, comfort, and status not like this one, reinforced our unstated presumption that the world was divided into those entitled to safety within those walls and those only entitled to lie dead outside. Americans seemed to oscillate between identification and disidentification with the Vietnamese peasants being displaced and killed. I put the war into such homes. I should show you one that sort of does that. and into more lavishly provisioned ones from House Beautiful and other upscale magazines. Rather than some disconnected vantage point, these rooms offered the viewer a place to enter, literalizing the question, where do you stand? I wanted as well to indicate the demands on women in creating and maintaining these American fortress homes, which after all, provided the alibi for aggression abroad to be recast as protection and safeguard. I hope that by resituating the figures and the landscape, people would see it all differently, unframed by body counts, troop call-ups, patriotic invocations, geopolitical domino theory, godless communism, and unashamed racism. I made photocopies to hand out. Another important, this is not them, obviously, another important realization. I knew I'd be accused of making propaganda, not art, as a, and I was so accused, of course. And I decided, so be it. I didn't sign or date the cutouts because I knew that putting the casualties of a present war in an art institution would be obscene. Therefore, this was not art. Eventually, I published a few in the underground newspapers that were so much a feature of the age. And I'm um, going to show you. So this is the only one with text, but it's native text to the image. Um, uh, I uh, worked with a feminist newspaper in San Diego called Goodbye to All That. This is one of the newspaper images. And this is another one. Oh, that's. That image that was <laughs> there's an image there. It disappeared. That's so interesting. It, it, wow. Okay. <laughs> it was a naked Asian playboy model in front of a group of soldiers. Uh, and this is Mrs. Nixon and Pat Dunaway and Bonnie and Clyde. So I was moving in a number of different directions. But not to talk about me. I'll continue talking about me in another way. <laughs> Eventually, I published a few in the underground newspapers, and I meant to print the works as photos someday. But for now, they live to do agitational work. And as you may know, since a, one of them appears on, as the sort of ad for or handout for today's event, thank you. I returned to it for complex reasons in the, uh, during the war that we're now told is over. I was just told that by a curator. Um, the longest wars we've ever been in, in Afghanistan and Iraq. At the turn of the 70s, living in San Diego, I joined the Women's Liberation Front, a socialist feminist group even before I entered grad school there. We aimed many of our efforts outside the university perch and local women married and single were in our group. 
We joined up with other like-minded women in the area. Our homogeneity in class and race, undeniable and deeply uncomfortable, was traceable in part to university and neighborhood demographics, but also, and we were cognizant of the suggestion of the Panthers that we all ought to organize in our own communities. African American and Chicano Latino communities were organizing their own right, although we all came together as part of quote unquote the movement. It was a movement moment, a moment of solidarity and of course strife. Politics is raucous. And we all hung out with Herbert Marcuse and had dance parties every week. Our women's group spoke at high schools and in people's living rooms and we hosted speakers, held consciousness raising sessions and started a campus daycare center for students and staff that lasted decades. We participated in the anti-war demos and actions but always as a separate presence since we didn't tolerate bullying from the men. <coughs> Locally, we often headed up the marches with our small children if we deemed it safe, because there were times when it wasn't at all safe. And aside, my son used to say when he was a teenager, my first memory is being on a demonstration. <laughs> and then as, when he grew up, he said, my first memory is on being. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to this world. <laughs> Feminist artists on campus went up to LA a lot to hang out with sisters there, especially ones around the new Cal Arts and the even newer women's building. I made a series of works, including stuffed clothing that did not impress my MFA advisor. <laughs> I got a new advisor. <laughs> I made works of women's clothing and my sons used diapers against the war as well as to interrupt the vehement disidentification of Americans. Clean, but each one of these, uh, or pretty much all of them, have the word gook on there, which for those who remember John McCain as he fades away, even up until the last decade, he was referring to the Vietnamese as gooks. Um, and of course, that's the analog to what used to be on the diapers when they were biologically, when it was biologically produced shit. Um, the push-pull of identification and disidentification, oh, I have to show you some, some other stuff, okay. This is some women prisoners of the Thieu regime in the infamous Pulo Condori prison in South Vietnam, I have no idea to pronounce it. But on the clothing, which was just discarded uh, clothing of uh, American women, was the name, date of birth, and serial number of uh, prisoner, uh, political prisoner. Uh, the push-pull of identification and disidentification is also behind a floor work called She Sees in Herself a New Woman Every Day with unstylish shoes and an imaginary conversation on audio between a woman and her mother about standing on your own two feet. This is becoming unruly. It's telling me I'm late and I better hurry up. Um, and of course, the photos were taken by the oh, wow. were taken by the photographer. <laughs> so interesting. Uh, yes, it's okay. Inbuilt systems of control. I ran a garage sale in an art gallery as a way of pointing to differential systems of valuation, as you heard, in household economies during a downturn. Uh, as it was in 1973, we had the oil shock. It was a tremendous crisis. And valuation of things in the art world. And also, the garage sale was intended to point to the role of women in that liminal space of commerce between the home and a difficult cash economy. This show, once ignored, found itself about two decades later, much sought after for muse by museums after shopping moved to the center of culture and the art world. And its final iteration appeared during the 2012 Christmas shopping period in the atrium at MoMA. And I'll just show you 73 and 77. Suzanne, you see yourself in there and so many other friends. So this is MoMA. 
actually was bigger than it looked. <laughs> Cheap thrills. In the early 70s, I focused on systems of food production and consumption, looking at the various demands that women had to answer to as producers and consumers, as middle class women and working class women, as aspirational housewives, as county fair home baking contestants, as migrant workers from Mexico, as fast food workers and waitresses, and so on. I continued to link the roles of producer and consumer, and also the regions of the world exploited for provisions and raw materials, and the romance of Exotica. I did performances, I made installations, and I learned video. Um, I'm not gonna take the time to explain these. You have to take my word for it, that it matters. Um, <laughs> Um, I made some Super 8 films about Latino migrant labor and about women, children, and backyard economies of laundry, watering the lawn, mowing the lawn, and minding the kids. This is a gourmet experience, which was an extravaganza far too complicated to explain. Um, I have to say, I hope that doesn't apply to what I've offered you today. It never occurred to me that by inviting people to a banquet in a gallery that I was expected to be serving food. <laughs> Just, wait, this is, you know, art. We can eat later. <laughs> Up to the mid-70s, oh, I threw these in because I couldn't resist. Um, it might be interesting to talk about them, but these are one-minute PSAs from the 90s uh, in Seattle with Native Americans from Seattle. And that's all I'm going to say about it. And it seems stupid to leave this out. I did leave out Vogue, uh, Martha Russell Reed's Vogue, but this is about surrogate motherhood. So now that was uh, a against chronology. So I'm going to go back. In the mid-70s, I distributed my work outside the institutionalized art world for the postcard novels. However, I used my friend Eleanor Anton's art world mailing list following her offer and the uh, example of her 100 boots. My postcard novels told stories of women in different relation to making and serving as food. I wrote them as first-person accounts in response to the rise of first-person artworks by women artists, but I avoided handwriting. The works were sparked by my consternation over a little book I found in the supermarket, Homemade, M-A-I-D, Spanish, How to Talk to Your Housekeeper Without Learning Spanish. <laughs> the little serial novels were the stories of first, an aspirational housewife, a budding gourmet, a fast food worker with big ideas, McTower's maid, she wanted to make a revolution from a hamburger stand and a live-in housekeeper from Mexico. That story, Tijuana Maid, was based in part on interviews I conducted in North San Diego County. I wrote the story in English, but it was translated into Spanish by a group of my Mexican and Chicano friends at UCSD. If you wanted the story in English, you had to send me a buck 50. Nevertheless, a Chicano artist and activist privately questioned my right to tell that story, which surprised me and annoyed his partner, a friend of mine. My San Diego political photo and media group of school, group, small group, of mostly men, please note, spent a lot of time on questions of, oh, I'm just gonna end that with this. Um, we spent a lot of time on questions of representation and especially social documentary because post-war modernist aestheticism had blunted its class conscious teeth. We chewed over documentary history and theory and its relation to the art world on the understanding that, as Fred Lonadier put it, we should cede neither, territory, neither of the two territories, the art world, the non-art world, now that modernism was on its knees. We studied art and we studied politics. A couple of us joined the Marxist literary group run by Fred Jameson. 
temporarily back in New York where I made semiotics of the kitchen. I shot the photos for the Bowery and two inadequate descriptive systems, a work about representation and the question of speaking for others. A work, to my mind, profoundly informed by feminism. This work was meant to be hung in museums and galleries to stand in dialogue with documentary works. I moved to San Francisco to the Mission, a mostly Mexican and Chicano district with many refugees from the wars in Central America in which the US was heavily involved. The video Secrets from the Street No Disclosure about urban overlap included a drive through this Latino community pushing back against treatment as the fetishized but policed internal other, that is, Latinos who lived in the mission were treated as a place of internal tourism by the powers that be in Anglo um, San Francisco and in solidarity with refugees from the Central Mountain War. I don't think I have an image of it. In domination and the everyday, a woman feeds her child while on the radio, another woman interviews an LA art dealer. The visuals, all stills, are a montage of ads, movie stills, and photos of family life. Stop that. Oh, wrong machine. Um, wow. I sent myself back to the first page. This is unconscious. Be done already. <laughs> In Domination in the Everyday, a woman feeds her child while on the radio, another woman interviews an LA art dealer. The visuals, all stills, are a montage of ads, movie stills, and photos of family life and women's appearances, and a comparison with the thugs of the Chilean coup. Typically, this work asks viewers to choose their focus of attention. In the next decade, the 80s, Reagan, Thatcher, neoliberalism, warmongering, and terrifying nuclear saber rattling. Star Wars, remember that. Re and I don't mean the movie. Reactivated my longtime concern with war, imperialism, and national security issues. Several works dealt with nuclear war, others with torture and disinformation. The three channel global taste, which I'm not showing you. A meal, this is um, a simple case for torture or how to sleep at night. The, the three-channel global taste, the meal in three courses, centered on English language domination, U.S. data superiority, and neo-imperialism with food ads, talking women, talking animals, talking foreigners, statistics, and tryouts for a TV commercial. So there were three channels that took a different, a different point of view on uh, various questions about what's on the media and how it gets there. The Secret of the Rosenbergs of 1988 showed Ethel Rosenberg as scapegoat in a grotesque, draw, long drawn out spy panic during the Korean War of the early 1950s. In case you don't know, and many of you certainly don't, uh, Ethel Rosenberg and Julius Rosenberg were accused in the early 50s while we were at war in Korea um, of having purloined a, uh, nuclear secrets from Los Alamos during World War II and sold them, or gave them, to our then ally, Russia, now our greatest adversary. And they were put to death for a conspiracy to commit espionage after two years of struggle and public calls from the Pope and uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and leading lights, please don't kill those people. But um, at UC Boulder, in a very large installation and performance work on nuclear war, I worked with students and held a local panel with uh, and held a panel with local Central American activists. This was my first effort to work with others and host activist groups who might not otherwise have access to this audience for the exhibition. And uh, UC Boulder is very close to NORAD, which was the nuclear center underground in Cheyenne Mountain from which all the nuclear bombers were deployed. 
Neoliberalism and gentrification ended my refusal to add housing to the bodies of works I'd done about food and clothing. At the Dia Art Foundation in New York, I put together a project on the newly emergent, widespread crushing homelessness during the Reagan recession. Enlisting the help of then student Dan Wiley, we set about inviting people and groups, including artists, photographers, filmmakers, housing activists, tenant advocates, poets, writers, squatters, architects and urbanists, school children and teachers, and citizens groups to participate to avoid a show that evoked liberal responses of charity and guilt. I divided the six months allotted into three consecutive shows and four public forums, all under the rubric, If You Lived Here. The shows were organized around, first, fighting displacement, second, the various conditions of homelessness, and third, urban design and planning. We began by meeting with a group of homeless people calling themselves Homeward Bound Community Services who had slept out in City Hall Park for over 100 days, consulting with them and other groups over their show participation. Now I see my slides are somewhat out of order, so I'm just going to say this work, which no one paid any attention to, I thought, at the time, wound up in 10,000 subsequent places um, for various reasons. Um, that had to do as much with the how to mount an exhibition as with the actual content, in my opinion. But, so this is Homeward Bound. And what Homeward Bound asked for was an office in the middle of the gallery so they could have outreach and hold workshops, which they did, and parties, which they did. I always said that this was the one work in the show that I would buy if I could. Was uh, by Andrew Castrucci of the Squatter Artist Collective Bullet Space. No longer funny. He, he looks like a drowned fish. Homeward Bound also participated in the forum panels and other public events and on the radio as homelessness was increasingly of important concern in New York City. I say this in LA. We also worked with the Madhousers, an Atlanta-based group who built huts with homeless clients while helping them guide through social services. And I left out my image of them by mistake. But many other groups participated. And this is the archive show. Um, which I'll get to in a minute. We're in, approaching the end. Um, for the Singapore Biennale of 2011, I worked on a public garden with women artists, students, and migrants, and a few men. Um, but all the invitations came through women artists who invited not only their friends, but also their students and their student teachers. And um, the group on the right, if I had more time, I would talk about the conditions of labor in Singapore, but I don't, is migrant workers who are in the country on sufferance of not getting sick or anything like that, but they have no labor laws protecting them and no mandated time off. The reason that these women could participate in the exhibition was that mostly they worked for academics who had a different attitude toward at least allowing people to have a day or a half a day off. Um, so we built a garden, which is very hard to see um, from this image. It's very extensive and there were many projects and this is the group of people who participated one February in 2011. Yes, another two minutes and I'll be done. In Poland four years ago, I worked with a group of artists and activists on a public project of town hall meetings I called Guide for the Perplexed, discussing in a series of open public meetings how to be a woman, an artist, an immigrant in the new Poland, how to get a job, how to clean up the environment, what 
to put in the new Jewish Museum? And should there be a Polish colony on Mars? <laughs> Which was actually an issue about national identity. The opening event was the gender panel, um, which included the participation top center of the only transgender, transgender MP in Poland at the time. And I often wonder if she's still in office. Um, the Housing Homelessness Project, if you lived here, wound up having a long life, as I showed, reconstituted and rethought each time with a symposium or symposia in a number of venues on three continents. I mostly worked with local people and groups and in venues including Rennes, Utrecht, and Barcelona, most recently in Seattle and New York. Those two were both in 2016, and what happened in Seattle, I won't even describe, but the show was shut down by the person who sponsored it. I'm going to describe it. <laughs> We're supposed to have three shows, like the original. We got to one community fight back. We got to two, which is um, homelessness. We got to three, which is urban questions, and abruptly the sponsor canceled the show, closed down her space, fired all the employees, and waved bye-bye, supposedly on the basis of the health of her husband. But some have speculated it may be because when you talk about urbanism and questions of homelessness and the right to the city, you are treading on the toes of people who may be your friends in the community of wealth and ownership. Friends. Um, okay. Okay. So this was um, New York City in 2016. None of these photos really work, but they were people from the original New York show in 89, including Andrew Castrucci. And um, you can see the, he insisted on putting bottles giant bottles of piss in front of them. <laughs> yes. So there were forums in 89 and there were forums in 2016. <clears throat> they made me be on that panel. Increasingly in the US, when I talk about this project now, I'm asked by young people, in one way or another, if I'm exploiting homeless and poorly housed people by including them in a work that is under my name. We must ask what, aside from sheer iconoclasm, especially that posed by a single voice, can be an approach collectively and even individually as artists, historians, curators, that includes among these urgent questions of narrative entitlement, ways to create political alliances and movements of solidarity, such as we see in other areas. I can't help mentioning the high schoolers' movement of outrage and its demands for gun control. Yeah. I'm also going to be a complete idiot and mention Black Panther and say, think about all the questions of oppression, ownership, generosity, and so on that are at the heart of that movie and its iteration at this moment. So interesting. And I'm about to butcher someone's name, but she's used to it. As Kianga Yamada Taylor has said of the Women's March last year, and this is from her article in The Guardian, takes a white-skinned woman like me 
to hang on to this as uh, an important way of articulating this. Quote, think the Women's March wasn't radical enough? Do something about it. It might not have been as black, brown, or working class as many might have liked, but criticizing it from the sidelines doesn't help anyone. Look around social media and you can read critiques and even denunciations of the marchers. These are separate quotes of hers from this article. The women's marches were the beginning, not the end. What happens next will be decided by what we do. Movements do not come to us from heaven fully formed and organized. They are built by actual people with all their political questions, weaknesses, and strengths." Unquote. I recommend her article and her political point of view, and I thank you for staying for this talk. Thank you for the wonderful talk. I had a question, a simple question about um, technology and cybernetics, uh, those roles, and the critique of um, government and the war machine. Like, how, how do you think about technology other than a lens of communicating a message? So in some way, you're making a commentary that uh, I have to think about world organization as a totality and all those displaced people. So I think that's why I was thinking about cybernetics and the idea okay. of technology. So obviously, all joking aside, this is a, a major issue. However, I do want to point out, when I denounce the denunciations on social media, Twitter, call-out culture, which long predates even the internet, really, I always have to point out that they didn't make us, we made it. This is us. And that's why I quoted De Boer, even though he didn't quite get to saying, you know, this is about the organization of society and its productive capacities, and we need to think about how we position ourselves in relation to it. Um, many um, people, including on the list Net Time, which I read, a lovely bunch of white guys from mostly Eastern Europe, but some very interesting ideas. They're always arguing over the question of utopia and how we get there, and this is of great interest to me, but um, many, many visionaries have foundered on the idea of a utopian world, and you often wind up with this kind of libertarian guyism that somehow we're going to save ourselves or, you know, send our roadster to Mars or... Uh. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to be really kind and allow me not to get into this now. <laughs> We ain't got time. So, one last question. oh, or six, just one more quick question up at the top. Hi, thank you for a wonderful, truly inspiring talk. Uh, there are so many echoes between the moment when you were talking about in the late '60s and '70s, and today. What's your advice? Thank you so much for quoting Kianga Yamatha Taylor. Uh, What's your sense of the distance with that moment and your advice as someone who lived through that moment is now living through this one? Um, I'll, I'll tell you what has um, left me most confused. It's when a young woman I care about, a young woman artist of color said, Bernie told us we had to give up our identity. Well, I'm a Bernieite, surprise. Um, Yes, I voted for Hillary. Let's not get into this. <laughs> Voting is not a moral choice. Voting is a strategic choice. Let's leave it there. I don't even want to talk about the nature of the people involved. All I care about is what they were proposing right now. This is issue. Um, and this is one reason why I wanted to talk about Mary Richardson and how we form a narrative and how we judge acts. Um, I think... Um, that what we have done is, and what uh, Taylor specifically argues against, is thinking that things are handed to us in a minute, or that denunciation is the end of it, you know? Um, I think that movement building takes time and energy, and people used to always argue about clicktivism and, you know, uh, denounce people who. Uh, are on social media and have political opinions. Well, the Russian trolling aside, and it was not inconsiderable, and it's back. 
didn't stop people all over the world from getting together in 2011 for Occupy. That was really a world-shaking moment, even though it got shut down pretty quick, but the Paris Commune lasted like 70 days or something, and we're still talking about it, I hope. Um, what I'm saying is that people come together at particular moments to remind ourselves that we are people together and that this is not just about small comments of a certain number of words on whatever. Um, I, don't, I couldn't live without Facebook at this moment, but I also often feel like I need to wash my brain out and just go look at a tree or something. <laughs> because it both opens debate and forestalls debate. It encourages people to say things that make me want to cringe, but you know they don't, many of them don't actually mean those things. They don't mean the hard-edged denunciations. They're the same people, uh, and I learned this to my shock, same people engaging in blanket denunciations of certain classes of people are the same people who I'm working with who are all too willing to work together for a common goal, which has nothing to do with career advancement and so on. I'm not sure I'm answering your question. Um, but what I'm saying is that we need to remember that we're humans together first and that if we have goals in common, we ought to figure out how those multiple um, corners of a movement need to come together so that everyone feels their voices are heard and that they have a voice in shaping where the movement goes. I'm a big believer in movement building because I'm one of those people who believes that the only way any state acknowledges what's happening is by feet in the streets. So when I see, for example, uh, an, an academic um, in a gender studies department, a reputable scholar, I'm sure, denouncing the Women's March in Las Vegas this year for being white and old. <laughs> uh, it's how much do you have to ignore in order to get to that point, and how much do you foreclose by actually saying this? I don't mean to say, and she's handy because that's the, la for me to mention, she's the last person I read who said something like that a year, she obviously didn't read Taylor. Notice I'm skipping her first name. Um, but it's up to us to remember that we're always going to be um, denounced, doubted, and, and uh, called out by our sisters and other friends, and that it's up to us to decide what we need to do and how to do it, and to try to do it in solidarity and alliance with others. The one thing that interferes with this is being told that empathy is also not an, an available relationship among others. I think we need to have a conversation about empathy, and I thank you for your question.